The Long Hunter by J.A. Herring Episode 2, Trouble Roland stepped out from the courthouse of North Crossing, a purse full of 200 silver in his palm. He bounced it, feeling the weight, and opened it to peer inside. He was unsure if the bounty for the Hodig pelt was worth all he had lost. He took out a silver coin, one side stamped with six stars, symbolizing the six sovereign states of Waistra. The other, a bust depicting Callum Caballo, the supposed founder of the first colony in Waistra. Depictions of the man varied so much from one to another that Roland had wondered if he had ever truly existed at all. He placed the silver coin back in the purse and tucked it away in his haversack. Looking out over the grand city, the largest in all of Waistra, Roland felt his stomach churn. Crowds moved like ants in a colony, swarming around the buildings and stalls in the marketplace. They moved in the shadow of the city's great black tower that stood high above every other building within the city's palisades. The tower had once been cause for the city's construction. Large, mysterious, and made from an unforgeable black metal, it was studied ad nauseum by Elvunian scholars, but little was learned from it. Now it stood alone, taken back by nature and surrounded by overgrowth, casting its shadow across the great city like the hand of a sundial. A scream shook Roland from his thoughts. He glanced around to find its source and spotted it at once. A flamboyantly dressed Elvunian fop struggled against four witch hunters in tall, buckled hats as they hauled him towards a jail that adjoined the courthouse. The fop fought and jerked his arms in protest against the witch hunters, but to no avail. Unhand me, you ruffians! The man screamed. I am an artist, a painter. I am no warlock. You will receive your fair shake under the law, one of the witch hunters said. All do, eventually. Roland ignored them. It wasn't his problem. He had no love loss for the witch hunters or any members of the Reformed Church of Aldura, as they had once run his family out of Fort Daggerwood and into the neighboring hills. But he was not about to put his nose in their affairs. Whatever the fop had done to warrant their attention was his own problem. If Roland intervened in every witch trial in North Crossing, he would never be free of the city. He stepped down the stone stairs. Nearly every building and road in the city was made of brick, some painted, some not, some accented with slate or limestone, but nearly all brick. The brick was gathered and shipped from the swamps surrounding Stilton, acquired by trade. North Crossing was the breadbasket of Waystra, providing leather, salted meats, and all manner of grain, and as such it was easy for the city to acquire whatever it needed from the smaller settlements. Roland walked down the great hill leading from the courthouse, making his way down into the shadow of the black tower where all of the merchant stalls and shops formed a ring around a great fountain. He thought about the young highwaymen he had let live in Lakeview. He would have had to have come through North Crossing to resupply, but the likelihood of finding him was slim. What little trail he had left behind in the worn, heavily used North Road between Lakeview and North Crossing was a trail carved deep from fear. He had ridden his horse nonstop at full gallop to reach North Crossing, while Roland had taken his time, nearly five days of it, to reach the city. More than likely, the kid was gone. Roland restocked his supplies, a few pounds of hardtack and salted jerky, and a refill of his canteen at the well. He thought about spending the night in the city to allow his horses a night of pampering at the local stable. If the kid had fled south to the gang's camp to inform them of what had transpired in Lakeview, it would be months until he reached it. There was no rush. He approached the inn, a tall three-story building made of brick with a thatch roof. A job board hung on the wall beside the entrance, and before he could approach it to check it, a woman with her face concealed under the darkness of a cloak hurried to approach. It was an unusual sight midday, and the woman was doing a poor job of looking inconspicuous. She pinned something to the board and hastily took off, zigzagging through the crowd of customers investigating the nearby stalls. Roland approached the note and pulled it from the board. It read as follows. To whom it may concern, I am in dire need of assistance. I cannot go into detail here, but request you meet me at the Black Tower upon the strike of the midnight bell. Compensation will be high, but the utmost discretion is required. It had been left unsigned. Roland stuffed the note in his haversack. If he had one weakness, it was curiosity for adventure. Everything about the post reeked of trouble, from its finely looped writing to the scent of expensive perfume rising from the parchment. He wondered if he was making a mistake, but at the same time couldn't stop himself. He got a room at the inn and waited for midnight to approach. When Roland finally set out, oil lanterns illuminated the darkened city's streets. Their light ended at the grassy, overgrown land surrounding the Black Tower. Only the dim light of the waxing crescent moon helped guide his way as he slashed through the brush with his saber. 
Eventually, he reached a clearer path that wound back and ran along the palisade wall to the north, likely the path his mysterious employer had taken. He followed it up to the doorway at the base of the tower and peered inside. The walls of the tower were black and pitted and shone iridescent in the moonlight. They were made of the same strange metal that the Kadaran ruins he had come across in previous adventures had been made out of. Some folk had taken to calling it Umbrinium, claiming it was pulled from the darkest depths of Umberdur, a mythical cave system that ran deep all throughout Alder, connected by paths called the Nether Roads. He put little faith in rumors and legends, but had to admit that the substance somehow seemed alien, unnatural. A cloaked figure stepped forward from the shadow inside of the tower, letting the moonlight fall upon her as she lowered her cloak. She was a beautiful, fair-skinned woman with long, blonde hair. By Roland's best estimate, she couldn't have been much over twenty years of age. Now you know why I had to meet you here, alone. Roland shook his head slowly, confused. He had no idea who the woman was, nor why he should recognize her. The realization that she was a mystery to him dawned on her, and she breathed a sigh of relief. Oh, I'll do or be praised. You have no idea who I am, do you? That is fantastic. Better than fantastic. What do you want me to do? Roland asked, his curiosity aptly piqued. What I require of you is simple. I need you to take this silver and pay whatever fine has been levied against my, uh, friend, she explained. She produced a heavy pouch of silver, much heavier than the one that had been given to him for the Hodeg's hide, and tossed it over to him. How lucky she was that he had answered her letter and not some common bandit. Use what is necessary to purchase his freedom and keep the rest. I care not. I only want him freed. And what did your friend do? Roland asked. Nothing so scandalous. He was simply selling tinctures and tonics without a license, she explained. Ask for him by name when you arrive at the jail. Luke Primgian. He's a noble from Elvoon. She nearly swooned as the words left her mouth. Stepping fully out of the tower, she gazed up at the moonlight. A true noble, related to the queen, he said. Every Elvunian who comes through Waster claims they're a member of the five great houses, Roland grumbled. The woman gave him an annoyed glance over her shoulder. I'll free him, he reassured her. Oh, thank you, she gasped, grabbing his shoulders. He's the love of my life. You are doing a great thing. Roland turned to leave and then paused as the realization came over him. Wait a second now. Your precious Luke wouldn't have happened to have crossed the witch hunters, might he have? I'm not sure I see the difference. He's jailed either way, she explained. There is a marked difference between bribing a militiaman to free your bow and trying to get him liberated from the reformed church of Aldura. Roland explained. A militiaman might part ways with a prisoner for a pittance, but inquisitors had higher scruples. The fanaticism of the witch hunters was not so easily undermined. Is that a problem? the woman asked. Roland took out the heavy pouch of silver from his haversack. He debated tossing it back at her feet. He knew he should toss it back at her feet. He bounced it in his hand and felt its weight. Reluctantly, he slipped it back in his haversack. No, no problem. I'll get him for you, he said. And, uh, is there a name I should give him once he's liberated? Should I tell him who his benefactor was, or do you wish to remain anonymous? I'm sure he'll know, the woman said. He is new to Waster and has not made many friends. Plenty of enemies, though, by the looks of it, Rowan muttered. I will meet you in the old oak grove to the south of the city in three days' time, she said. I'll be there, Rowan replied. The following day, Rowan made his way to the jail adjoined to the courthouse. He walked in and found it to be a sizable place befitting of such a large city. A number of folk had been detained for a myriad of reasons and were all being held behind iron bars. Mostly men, but some women and even a few street urchins were all caged away. Towards the front of the building was a large holding cell filled up, but several of the other cells housed only one or two inmates. At the far end of the building stood a solitary cell ringed in etched runes and a circle of salt. Inside sat the Elvunian fop that Roland sought to free on behalf of his anonymous benefactor. Roland made his way up to a wooden desk with a militiaman behind it, scribbling notes onto a piece of parchment. The militiaman wore the typical regalia of a militiaman, a long, tan coat hanged from his narrow shoulders, and a gray tricorn hat sat perched atop two oversized ears. An arquebus rested against the wall next to the window that faced the palisades. The man took no notice of his approach, too invested in his work. Good morning, 
Roland said, startling the man. Uh, yes, uh, indeed, good morning, the militiaman said, covering his glass ink pot and placing his quill into its stand. Is there something I can help you with, citizen? That blonde fop over there, Roland said, pointing to the man in the warded cell. He's Luke Primgen, right? Yes, the militiaman said carefully. That is right. What did you want with him? I need to get him out of here. I'm willing to pay, Roland said plainly. I'm afraid no bail has been set. He is not under our jurisdiction, in truth, but uh, that of the Reformed Church of Aldura, the militiaman explained. He's not leaving that cell until they come for him. We don't interfere with the church's business, and they stay out of ours. They have their cell in your jail. Isn't that interfering? Roland asked. The governor has a standing agreement with them. They operate within the city, and we allow them a place to keep their prisoners until they see to dealing with them, the militiaman explained. That lot is everywhere, he added, lowering his voice to not be heard by the prisoners. We only see the reformed Church of Aldur and their inquisitors, but they belong to a secret society that has infiltrated all of Waestra. I'm not getting on their bad side. I've got a hundred silver, Roland said, lowering his voice to match the man's. More than you make in a week. Just leave the door open or something. No, the militiaman replied his voice raising for a moment before he regained control of his composure. I, I said no. If I let him out, they'll put me on a post and I'll be burning next. Consider this, Roland said, still keeping his voice low as to not be overheard. Maybe he bewitched you, magicked you into opening that door and letting him out, he explained. Two hundred silver. The militiaman wetted his lips. He looked about, a bit agitated, but torn. A fight was happening between his two big ears. Two hundred silver was no small amount, and the story Roland sold him was plausible. All he'd have to do is unlock the gate and convince the witch hunters that he had been bewitched. The witch hunters would hear what they wanted to hear. Fine, go and wait outside. Roland stepped outside of the jail and leaned against the cold brick wall. He looked out across the city again, out across the gathering morning crowds buying up salted meats from the square. So early in spring, hardly anything was fresh. He waited for a few minutes, hoping not to see any sign of the witch hunters. Getting the foppish Elvunian out of the city would be enough of a task. The last thing he needed was to make enemies with the reformed church of Aldura. After a few more minutes had passed, the fop emerged from the front doors, thoroughly confused. He spotted Roland and walked over to him. You! I saw you speaking with the guards before he freed me! He said in a high Elvunian accent, the sort of accent that implied intelligence where there might be none. Did you bewitch them? No, Roland replied. It was the strangest thing. The man just went all bleary-eyed and stumbled over to the cell, then unlocked it. Then he said, in an emotionless and monotone voice, You are free. I could scarcely believe it, the fop explained, gesticulating wildly with his arms. It was as if he had been hypnotized. The only thing I waved in front of his eyes was two hundred silver, Roland explained. Now come, we have to get you into something less noticeable. Here, he said, swinging his musket off of his shoulder and placing it on the ground. He took his outer coat off and tossed it to the fop. Put that on to cover up that garish outfit. This garish outfit, I'll have you know, is silk and crushed velvet. It is of the highest fashion in Elvoon, he explained, offended. Did you happen to see where my wig went? I doubt I could find a suitable replacement in these savage lands. No, and be glad for it. Likewise, be glad that you sweated that white powder off your face. You looked like a clown, Roland said, grabbing his musket up from the ground. Now let's hit an outfitter. We need you to look like a normal human being so you don't get stopped by the militia on the way out of the city. Out of the city? Luke asked as Roland pulled him along by his arm. Like, out into the wilds of the frontier? Roland ignored the question and continued pulling him along, down towards the marketplace. Why are you doing this anyway? Have we met? I'm doing this because an anonymous benefactor is paying me to, Roland explained. Was it Evelyn? Uh, Beatrice? Rosalina? Was it Vivian? Ooh, Helga? Luke asked. Roland ignored him as best as he could, guiding him into the outfitter. How did a fool like you get mistaken for a warlock or wizard or whatever anyway? Roland asked, shoving him towards the clothes hanging on the shelves near the entrance. They were unlike his attire in almost every way, not dyed in flamboyant purples and greens, but earthen tones, brown and tan. 
linen was bleached white or left brown. The deerskin jackets were tanned leather, some stained darker or lighter. Luke managed to immediately find a buckskin jacket with frills sewn along the sleeves. It was an honest mistake, Luke explained, trying on the jacket approvingly. I look like a regular native, now don't I? Roland didn't answer. I spent all of my earthly gold royals on a wagon and uh, some of the more popular medicinal treatments for my land. I had figured that Wastrons would uh, be glad to have the treatments, and I was right. I hadn't accounted for the Inquisitors, admittedly. They are a suspicious lot. Is there anything magical about your elixirs? Roland asked as Luke made his way up to the counter with an armful of clothes. The man behind the counter wrote down each of their items in the ledger, caring little about their discussion. No, not at all, Luke explained. In truth, most of them are made up of ink and water. Roland rubbed his face in frustration, then looked over at the fop. So you're nothing more than a snake oil salesman? There's no snake oil involved, Luke replied. How does one even acquire the oil of a snake? That'll be sixty-five silver pieces, the outfitter said. Roland produced the sixty-five silver and slid it over to him as Luke gathered up his clothes. After convincing the fop to abandon his old attire and don his new clothes in a nearby alleyway, the two men made for the front gate of the city. The militiamen let them by without a second glance, and they found themselves walking through the docks district just south of the city proper. Luke coughed and plugged his nose against the overwhelming stench of fish. Roland led him to the stables, where he retrieved his horses, Bell and Amity, and his dog, Rusty, who immediately took a liking to Luke. He swung himself up on Bell as Luke warily eyed Amity. Have you ridden before? Of course, Luke replied. I was trained from my youth to ride horse, but this one seems ill-tempered. Yeah, he doesn't like having a rider, Roland replied. You might just want to walk a bit. I use him as a pack horse, more or less. They traveled south along the Golden Road, named for the yellow limestone that made it up, as well as its status as the main trade road in Waistra. The Golden Road ran along the east coast, connecting North Crossing to the cities of Noxton, Stilton, and Last Respite. They traveled for only an hour along the farmlands and wildflower fields until the oak grove came into view. This is where your benefactor wanted to meet, Roland explained guiding his horse off the road and up the hill towards the grove, carving out a path through the grassy field on his way. In only two months' time, the bland, sodden fields around them would be littered with a blanket of orange wildflowers, violet irises, and black-eyed Susans. For now, tiny green buds were the only promise of future beauty amidst the dreary brown landscape. There, they would make camp and wait for two days amidst the ancient oak trees overlooking the road. For two days, the fop did not stop speaking. Roland had already grown tired of his company and silently pleaded with Aldura, a goddess he did not believe in, for the mysterious woman to arrive and take the fop off of his hands. It was noon and there was still no sign of her. Roland was beginning to worry that something had happened and that he might be stuck with the self-proclaimed artist and medicine man. I am truly curious as to who my guardian angel might be, Luke explained, prodding at some coals in the campfire. Roland had begun a new strategy of ignoring him, pretending not to hear him, and avoiding any conversation hooks he might throw out. The strategy had officially started the morning of the previous day, and despite it, the fop showed no signs of quieting down. It would have to be a woman of means. She paid you quite well, by the sounds of it, so she must be wealthy. He looked over at Roland and grinned. That just makes this all the more exciting. It is a shame we couldn't recover my wagon, but perhaps if she is as wealthy as she seems, she uh, can purchase me a replacement. She already saved you from burning at the stake. Roland finally chimed in. What more do you want from the poor girl? A wagon? I just said that, Luke explained, shaking his head dismissively. Then again, perhaps that career wasn't quite suited for me. During my days at the College of Goldeboro, I never once studied medicine. Perhaps I should lean into what I'm good at. And become a lawyer, Roland remarked. No, no, Luke replied hastily, waving away the idea. Although... Rusty bounced up from his sleeping position beside the fire and began to bark in the direction of the road. He wasn't much of a guard dog, but the approach of several men and a lone woman caught his attention. Roland grabbed his musket up from the tree and raised it as they came into view. Leading the pack was a stout, fat, bald man riding on a horse. Beside him, on a white horse with a braided mane, was the young blonde woman Roland had met with in the tower. On either side of them was a number of militiamen, totaling ten. The fat, bald man rode up to their camp and cleared his throat. 
two members of the militia leapt from their horses and assisted him in dismounting. Once dismounted, he paced briskly up to Roland and Luque and glared at them without saying a word. Roland slowly lowered his musket, seeing the arquebuses of the militiamen behind the stubby man poised to fire upon them at the slightest misstep. You there, the fat man said, thrusting a finger into Luque's chest. You are under arrest for adultery. Adultery? Luque gasped. I assure you, I am not married. Now, you nitwit, you adulterated my wife, the man squealed. Luque looked past him to the young blonde woman on a horse, her head sunken low. Oh, Jezebel, he called out at the sight of her. You're the one who had me freed. The fat man positioned himself between the fop and his wife, glaring up at him through tiny piggy eyes. Look at me, you, you nincompoop, he ordered. I said you adulterated my wife. How do you plead? That's illegal, Luque responded, perplexed. The fat man slapped him in the ear with an open palm, and the fop let out a gasp and fell dramatically to the ground, clutching his face. Roland pinched the bridge of his nose in frustration. And you! The fat man turned on Roland, glaring up at him. It became immediately clear that his wrath would not be sated so easily. You are under arrest for aiding and abetting an adulterer. I didn't aid and abet anyone, Roland replied. I just met the man on the road. We shared a couple stories around the fire. That's all. He lied. He was accustomed to lying to authority. Be they militia or governors, it meant no difference to him. If that is true, then you are truly unlucky, the fat man explained. Seize them! Not so fast, governor. A cold voice drawled out from behind the militia. Four men in buckled coats and matching black buckled hats appeared on horseback. By our agreement, our arrest supersedes yours, and we will have our escaped warlock back, the witch hunter said. Nonsense, the fat governor squealed back at him. I made that agreement to avoid trouble with your superstitious little guild. You stay out of my affairs and I stay out of yours. That was our agreement, so be gone. You grow overconfident in your position, governor. The witch hunter spoke again in the same cold voice. How many of your men carry the brand of the Free Brothers? How many here would stand beside you if you got in our way? You are in your position because we ordained it to be so. Because you were an obedient little dog. Bite my hand here and you will be put down. The fat governor quivered slightly at the threat. He pursed his lips and squinted up at the man. Fine, Morald, he said, gesturing for his men to come help him back up onto his horse. What do I care if he rots in my cell or burns at the stake? I assume you can handle bringing him back to town without aid? No aid is required, Governor. The witch hunter Moral drawled and tipped the wide brim of his hat. The governor and his men departed. His young wife paused as she turned on horseback, momentarily glancing back to meet eyes with Luque. They exchanged a longing look. Then she left him to his fate. Luque picked himself up off of the ground and dusted the dirt from his clothes, stepping back between the fire and the horses. Now, on to business. Moral dismounted while the other three witch hunters stayed on their horses and walked slowly towards the men. I'm not aiding and abetting anything, am I? Roland asked, confirming his problems ended with the governor. Moral chuckled and shook his head. <laughs> no, no, nothing like that, he explained, pausing to meet eyes with Roland. His face was hawkish, and his nose pointed. His eyes appeared gray under the shadow of his wide-brimmed hat. We only want the warlock, he said. He stepped past Roland and towards Luque, who immediately took a few paces back. There is nothing to fear, boy. Come with me, and if you are innocent, Aldur will welcome you with open arms. Luque looked to Roland for help, but found none. He had gotten himself into this mess, and Roland was not getting involved. Then, without a second thought, Luque pulled himself up onto Bell with surprising agility and clicked his heels. He and the horse galloped away, and a rope that had been securing the horse to the ground with a flimsy wooden stake was pulled loose. Roland glared after Luque, then back at the witch hunter who was rapidly unsheathing his rapier. Roland freed his saber from its scabbard and parried an attack. The other three witch hunters began pursuit of Luque, but one was promptly tackled to the ground as Rusty leaped up and bit onto the throat of the witch hunter's horse. 
the fall of the horse crushed the man's leg, and Rusty ran back, turning his attention on the witch hunter, assaulting his master. He chomped under Merald's leg, distracting him long enough for Roland to slash his saber across his throat. Merald fell to the ground, holding his bleeding neck tightly with his black leather gloves. Roland rushed over to Amity and pulled himself up. The horse protested, but he drove his heels into the flanks of the beast and forced it forward. Rusty ran alongside him as he gave chase, as much after his horse-thief friend as the two witch hunters pursuing him. Amity was doing little to aid the endeavor, fighting against Roland every step of the way. He had little to no hope of catching the well-trained mounts utilized by the witch hunters or Bell. Luke, it turned out, wasn't lying about one thing. He was masterful on horseback. Roland leveled his musket at the witch hunters shrinking from view. He fired off a shot but missed. Much to his luck, he discovered Luke had rounded back in his efforts to lose the witch hunters. Roland reloaded his musket and waited. The oak trees did little to hide him from view, but the witch hunters were singularly focused on catching their target. As Luke rode back towards him, the witch hunters came closer into view. Roland waited patiently as they neared, and then aimed his weapon again and breathed out as he squeezed the trigger. A cloud of smoke mingled amidst the oak trees, and through it Roland spotted the silhouette of a witch hunter tumbling off of his horse. The smoke cleared as Luke bolted past, the second witch hunter close on his tail. This one, seeing the tide of the fight turn, had decided to treat the fight more seriously. He drew his shortened arquebus and fired at Roland, causing Bark to explode off of a nearby tree. Roland reloaded his musket as the man reloaded his carbine. They were stopped a short distance from one another, no greater than 15 paces. Whichever weapon got reloaded first would be that of the survivor. The witch hunter, accustomed to stalking defenseless prey, was a fraction of a second too late. Roland fired his musket and landed a shot on the left breast of the hunter, knocking him from his horse. He dangled, gasping as his mount took off from the noise, dragging him through the brush. Roland looked off in the direction of Luke, who had made his way back towards the road. He had little chance of catching up to him as long as he was on Bell. He cursed under his breath. Then a moment later, Luke appeared again, riding back in his direction, away from the road. Roland watched him with a puzzled look as he hurriedly approached. The militia is coming! They heard the gunfire! Luke yelled out as he rode past. Wait! Hold up! Roland yelled out after him. This horse ain't trained for a rider. He forced Amity as best as he could after Bell. Rusty ran circles around him as he fought the horse to move forward. He glanced back and found no sign of the militia. They could still be a good ways off. Again, he dug his heels into the horse's flanks, urging him onward. He wouldn't catch Luke on horseback, but he would at least manage to lose the militia in the fields of tall grass outside of the grove. Eventually, he came across some divots carved out by a horse's hooves, and after following them until the waning light of the day, he discovered Luke and Bell posted up under a red maple. After Roland gave Luke a thorough verbal hiding, the two men would make camp for the night, relieved they had escaped the day with their lives, deciding it would be some time before either of them ever set foot in North Crossing again.